I have to say that I remember us being here last year when we launched uh, the fundraising regulator. And since that, 12 months have gone by, which have been incredibly busy uh, for the committee. Uh, we've been working on a number of complex issues, some of which have already been referred to by Michael, Margaret, and, and Michael. And I want to start first by recognizing the hard work of my committee members, both fundraisers and non-fundraisers. And I would also like to particularly uh, commend the hard work of the executive who has been supporting the committee, uh, Gerald Oppenheim, Stephen Service, and Ed Brown, who have been going beyond the call of duty sometimes as I write them emails very late at night and they even answer me even later at night. Um, the Code of Fundraising Practice, you may remember, was launched last year in the sense that it was transferred over to us, uh, the fundraising regulator from the Institute of Fundraising. And some six months later, uh, we launched, and let's see if we can get up, yes, we launched our uh, first major consultation, which I hope many in this room responded to. It closed in April, and in fact, the committee was meeting yesterday to look at the uh, responses we received and how that should influence uh, the changes we were proposing in the code. The consultation asked for responses on a variety of subjects, and these came from a variety of sources. Uh, public complaints, obviously, being one, fundraising queries, um, a good illustration of the relationship between bringing together complaint adjudication and the code was illustrated by what influence came into uh, that consultation. And that, of course, was a recommendation uh, when we were, so Stuart was looking at how the new regulation of fundraising uh, should, in fact, the act have been, as you know, uh, changes in the regulatory context, such as in the Charities Act 2016, and new guidance from the Charity Commission. And you've just heard Michael speak about neat feet. Um, and that, of course, had an influence on certain questions we wanted to ask uh, in the consultation and proposes of changes to the code. This is the list, uh, for those who uh, want to see the full list, of items that we in fact covered in that consultation. But while there are many of those, there is an important theme that runs through them. And that's the way the public experiences fundraising. And when they feel unreasonably pressured, we do understand that to ask is a pressure, but it's a question of where is the proportionality. And that is what we're trying to find in the code so that fundraisers can do the excellent job that they do, while at the same time donors feel respected and appreciated for what they are able to deliver and contribute to people in uh, vulnerable circumstances. Um, and the important thing is, when you ask someone, can they make that important informed decision to donate on the basis of the code as it stood, or did it need any tweaking, any amendment, any new additions to it? Another feature, of course, that came somewhat from neat feet is this question about the relationship between charities and third parties acting as their agents in respect of fundraising. Um, it's important uh, that charities are clear what their expectations are when working with third parties and in also ensuring that there is a very smooth process for staff or volunteers who have concerns to be able to raise them so that they can be dealt with and, and uh, remedied. One of the things that's important to the fundraising regulator is to hear, not only from the sector, and we want to hear from the sector, and of course, as Michael was saying, there have been many meetings, lectures, um, events, which other people have participated, including myself, and for which I'm grateful for the invitation to speak about the code. But important to us, and sometimes more difficult to, to actually get responses from, is from the public. So what we did um, is that we went and had a public workshop, three public workshops, one of which I actually attended to see actually how it was conducted and how people would participate, so that we could find out what the public feels about a number of areas uh, that we were concerned of. They were things like the fundraising ask solicitation statement, particularly when should it be made, and how do you deal with people who are in vulnerable circumstances. Um, I should say that yesterday at the committee, 
we were working on the response paper that we will be publishing, and in that will contain um, information about the public workshop. So you can see exactly what the public were telling us and, and advising each other about how they felt about um, fundraising. And it was interesting not only to see them speaking about it, but interacting with each other, particularly where they've had some relationship with a charity or not. And, and I have to say that their most common relationship was actually on the street and being uh, accosted or asked for um, donations. And uh, the findings confirmed, I'm happy to say, uh, that we were on the right track, including the subjects in our consultation, as they did reflect the concerns of the public. Not only were these subjects that the workshop participants felt passionately about, they agreed with uh, many of the changes we proposed recognizing, and they did recognize, that it was often a very difficult balance between the need of fundraisers and donors and what donors expected. They were sensitive to that, they were sophisticated about that, and they acknowledged that. And I think that's quite an important thing to recognize. So what's next uh, for the Standards Committee? Um, well, I think we've made a good start. Um, there are still other areas that the code requires attention. You've heard already about um, data protection and GDPR and Michael's uh, statement that at least 50 changes in the code. Um, we saw the first cut of that yesterday and I didn't count them, but I, I take his word for it. He probably has. Um, and of course there's guidance on consent. We're also going to start thinking about looking at the code as a whole. Um, we didn't want to do that initially, right off the bat, but now that we've been in for a year, things have settled down. We'd like to make the code as user-friendly and comprehensible and um, easy to uh, work with, because we recognize that lots of charities do not have massive fundraising teams or massive um, support. There are lots of small charities, and they need to work according to the code, and they need it as user-friendly and as helpful as possible, and not only the code, but the guidance, and I know the Institute of Fundraising is very involved in that as well. So we want both the public and fundraisers, and this is the key, to have confidence in the code as a clear, effective, and proportionate way of demonstrating that charities hold themselves to high standards, and that the public can have confidence in charitable fundraising. I'm now going to hand over to probably the star talk of the day because it is like its first birthday, which is a fundraising preference service, and Jenny's going to speak from the chair. So Jenny Williams, fundraising preference service, um, good birth.